My name's Tyler Norwood. I'm the director of Robin's Wish, and uh, happy to be on for Robin's Wish. And this is Factual America. Factual America is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for an international audience. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and every week we look at America through the lens of documentary filmmaking by interviewing filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, to find out where you can see our films, and to connect with our team. On August 11th, 2014, the world was shocked to find out that Robin Williams had died by suicide. For someone who brought so much humor to the world, it was a tragic, traumatic end. But no one knew how much more there was to the story. Left to speculate on Robin's motives, the media circus spun out further and further, leaving the public in the dark about a complicated and obscured truth. Robin, bright, funny, quick-witted, had lost a battle against an unknown enemy, the nearly impossible to diagnose brain disease, Lewy body dementia. Filmmaker Tyler Norwood brings this story to the screen for the first time in his documentary, Robin's Wish. We caught up recently with Tyler from San Diego, California. Tyler Norwood, welcome to Factual America. Tyler, how are things for you there, I gather, in San Diego? Uh, They're wonderful. It's warm and sunny, which is very pleasurable, and um, happy to be on the show today. It's great to have you. Um, Now, you're a uh, director, producer, cinematographer, and writer. That's just your credits on the film we're going to be talking about today, but... uh, no, you've done others, um, other docs. Uh, United States of Detroit is for, for one that's fairly recent. Um, but the film we're talking about today is Robin's Wish, which has come out this year. It's a, basically a film about the last year and a half of Robin Williams' life. Uh, but we'll talk more about that very shortly. Uh, unfortunately, Robin uh, passed away on August 11th, 2014. Uh, where can listeners find this film? I know it's, it was released in September. Uh, yes, yeah, so it should be everywhere. So I know that we're on Amazon, Google Play, iTunes, um, YouTube, okay. on and on and on. Okay. We have a good distributor. They got it, they got it everywhere. Okay, that's, that's excellent news because it's uh, definitely worth a, a film worth people uh, watching. That's, that's for sure. So, so thanks again for coming on and for making this film. Um, for those of our listeners who haven't seen it, maybe you could give us a, um, a little synopsis of the film, if you don't mind. The, uh, again, it's uh, called mm. Robin's Wish, if I haven't said that already. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the film chronicles a really unknown chapter of Robin Williams' life, because I think, you know, there's been some really amazing uh, biopics made about this, you know, iconic figure um, yeah. that cover where he was born and his early rise to fame and all that stuff. But actually, the, the way that Robin passed from this world, we, we sort of didn't really get a clear uh, understanding of. And that was one, because um, what, what it actually was, he didn't know during his lifetime. Yeah. Uh, and then two is that uh, even his wife and, and family members didn't know until after his autopsy, which was three months after he passed. Um, so finding this rare neurological disease, Lewy body dementia, just like rife throughout his brain, you know, neurologist said it's one of the worst cases they'd ever seen. Um, the idea that that was kind of unknown information and, and really missed the news cycle around his death. Cause you know, when, when he dies, you, you want to report whatever the story is within a day or two. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the idea that the science wasn't clear until three months later left this as a sort of story that was untold. Um, mm. And so the, the powerful thing I think this film does is reveal that truth, reveal the truth of who Robin was as a man, uh, which I really fell in love with was the idea of like, you know, Robin Williams is larger than life, but Robin, you know, that was really just a beautiful human being that um, was behind all that incredible work. And so we, we did, a, I think, a good job of, of revealing that person. And so, so you learn what really happened to him, what he went through. Uh, I think if you're trying to understand someone, um, the way that they, they face adversity, and I, I think you mm-hmm. could easily say that this, this Louis body dimension that he faced was his biggest adversity in his life. Uh, you learn a lot about who he really was, um, because I think that's that's when you either bend or break or or, or stand up. And I think he stood up, and uh, the film's really a testament to that about about who he really was and, and getting that story correct around why he left uh, left us all. Well, I think these are all issues we're going to then delve into a little in a little more detail here, hopefully. Um, one often in uh, 
uh, episodes like this one where we're talking about someone who's who's famous, I often uh, have to say, well, ask who will, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that person because, uh, you know, generationally people may not know him. But the thing is with Robin Williams, I mean, I mention it to my kids and they know immediately who he is. I mean, he's Teddy Roosevelt at night at the museum. I mean, I don't think we have to tell the world who Robin Williams is. That's the, that's the amazing thing um, about this. Um, but uh, I think w one thing you did capture, you did have a little bit of a look back um, at the Robin Williams that, uh, well, I think we, we know and love. Um, so if you don't mind, we've got a, uh, you've provided us with some clips. So we're gonna listen to another one about, um, I think this is Sean Levy from uh, the director producer of Night at the Museum series about Robin, how he was always on. When you're in the room with Robin, it is full go. Uh, thank you. Not at all. Theodore Roosevelt, 26th president of these United States of America at your service. He was a constant spark, comedic spark, idea spark, throwing in lines, improvising a ton. Some of the biggest laughs are things that Robin invented on the fly. I remember many, many days where Ben Siller and I would look at each other because we're just watching Robin Williams off the top of his head just go off. And that kind of manic, wildly creative, bottomless pit of ideas, um, that mojo, that ability, which was like a superpower, I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> I mean, I think that's uh, a good sort of synopsis of the Robin Williams I grew up with. Um, uh, you know, it was just amazing. I mean, his appearances on like talk shows and The Tonight Show were just iconic. These are things you can still look up on YouTube and, and watch to this day. And they're, they're absolutely um, hilarious. We, we, we had never seen anything like this guy. Um, but you were already alluding to this. Um, that's the Robin we do know. But what didn't we know? Not so much about what he didn't know, but Tell us about those last uh, year and a half, two years. Um, what was what was Robin going through? But more, how were what were P others seeing? You know, uh, in terms of how Robin was mm. um, was living his his life. Yeah. So so Robin was, you know, experienced a slow and steady decline, um, which for him was deeply perceptible, right? It's the idea that the thing that we all recognize about Robin Williams and the reason that those shows that he did on Late Night, those appearances yeah. were so special is because you could see in real time that this yeah. like superhuman ability he had to create like entire worlds and fantasies and, and mm -hmm. like make us all laugh and draw us into these things that he was creating yeah. could, it could happen in a moment that he had that kind of faculty about him. Um, so he had these imperceptible sort of dips in, in his abilities, but he felt them very deeply. Um, and so, you know, you hear Sean Levy talking about that in the film, um, but it was basically this idea that, you know, he was having, he was having trouble remembering lines. He was having trouble comp like combining um, his lines with a performance. And, and that was very unusual for him because, you know, just, just months before uh, the last night at the museum film where, where these things started really becoming noticeable to others, um, you know, he was doing a one man show almost on Broadway called the Bengal tiger at the Baghdad zoo. And I mean, it was a one hour play where the, there's like, I think there's like a 10 minute intermission, but, but he's going full speed with almost all the lines and he never misses a beat because he's Robin Williams. Yeah. Um, but he, but he's, he starts noticing this, this, this steep and precipitous decline that begins, that begins in what, what I think his wife and his close friends experienced as a drip. Um, you know, he, he didn't feel quite as comfortable going up on stage and doing improv anymore, which like, you know, his wife describes as being, you know, she knew it was a bummer for him because that that was actually something that fueled him. He got so much joy out of it. And so to see him pull away from that, she was concerned, but thought, you know, he's, you know, he's 60 years old and maybe he wants to like slow down or hang out, you know, like mm. nothing, nothing where people were deeply concerned in the beginning. Um, but the idea that on Night at the Museum 3, uh, Sean Levy, the director, was having trouble getting a good performance from Robin. I think that's where people started going, oh, wow, like something is wrong. Okay. Um, and, then it, and then it extends to the last TV show Robin did. Um, so I don't want to jump too far ahead, but but you started. Yeah. They started noticing other symptoms there that were physical, and and he was having to get brain scans while he was in production on that show, which is yeah. never a good, never a good thing, and and deeply memorable yeah. if you're David E. Kelly, who's like helming that show. That if if your person yeah. at the top of the billing sheet um, is having to have brain scans, it's yeah. a, it's a scary moment. And I think I think actually the thing that's really powerful about this film um, is you get a lot of 
people coming forward who are saying, you know, I was deeply traumatized by what I saw my friend and my partner, my colleague go through. Um, and this was an opportunity for them to share those stories, which I think actually is really cathartic. Okay. I think, well, that brings us straight to the, uh, um, our next uh, and probably final clip, but uh, we don't want to show the whole film here. We want people to go and, uh, and look at it and digest it in its whole uh, hour and 16 minutes or so and, uh, and, and pay for it. Um, but uh, Sean Levy again is uh, talking about, um, or I think we may have a, actually another clip, but this is one where Sean Levy talks about shooting on the third film of uh, Night at the Museum and what they were uh, starting to see. The third movie, the last movie, I would say a month into the shoot, it was clear to me, it was clear to all of us on that set that something was going on with Robin. That's an experience that I've not spoken about um, publicly ever. We saw that Robin was struggling in a way that he hadn't before to remember lines and to combine the right words with the performance you know, when Robin would call me at 10 at night, at two in the morning, at four in the morning, saying, is it usable? Is any of this usable? Do I suck? What's going on? I would reassure him. And so I said, you are still you. You're Robin fucking Williams. I know it. The world knows it. You just need to remember that. My faith in him never left, but I saw his morale crumbling. I saw a guy who wasn't himself and he thought that was unforgivable. So we're already talking about this last uh, year and a half or two, uh, certainly really focus, I think the film focuses in on that, on 2014, because he was doing Night at the Museum and the TV show and also getting this treatment. Um, and I think it's very powerful there where, you know, Sean Levy basically says, uh, you know, he's getting calls in the middle of the night basically from Robin saying, do I suck? I mean, I am horrible. What, you know, is this any good? So um, you, you have his wife, Susan Schneider Williams on quite a bit, but she talks about the things that most, not even his friends were seeing or not directly. I mean, uh, paranoia, visions, panic attacks. Could you say maybe a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, so the one thing that became really clear to me um, in terms of telling the story is that, you know, Robin Williams was a corporation, right? Like, you know, the, the, the Tom mm. Hankses of the world, like these, these mega movie stars, you know, if mm. they work or don't work, you know, 50 or 60 people don't work or do work. Um, and so very when he, he started experiencing these symptoms, it was very important for everyone involved to say, okay, like, let's try and keep this out of the public eye. Let's try and kind of titrate, like, who knows what in like, sort of, so that we're, we're not giving away too much to too many people. And we're sort of keeping this as much under wraps as possible with the whole concept being like, once we know, then we can tell people, but we don't want to, we don't want to get people worried. Um, and, you know, yeah. so, so the idea that Susan, you know, his partner and primary caregiver, right. Um, was, was really with him through all these things. And they were really experiencing, you know, having to lie to their friends about like, oh, you know, Robin doesn't feel like he can go to this birthday party or that thing. Um, when it was really the fact that he couldn't go to these things, right? Like he was yeah. having real deep um, panic attacks and, and anxiety. And, and these are all symptoms of this Lewy body dementia that he had at that point and just didn't know. But, um, you know, it, it dysregulates your brain, right? It basically turns off parts of your brain with, with sort of inactivity. And, and so your brain tries to compensate, but you're still left sort of without the ability to, to process your things the normal way you would. Um, and so it, it really is the beginning of this deep decline. But the thing from Sean Levy that always sticks with me and makes me really feel for Robin is that, you know, Sean says, you know, I saw a guy who wasn't himself and he thought that was unforgivable. Um, for me, that really gets to the sense of service that Robin had, like the idea that he saw what he was doing as, as you know, this beautiful, like, you know, uh, exhilarating thing that he got to give the world, but that, that, that part of he got to give the world was really important to him. Um, yeah. And I think, I don't know if you'll play the, the clip where we find uh, a quote from him in, in one of his books after he's passed, but, you know, it's, it's the idea that service was so important to Robin that being being someone who could give the world a laugh, give the world a, a moment to feel something um, was deeply, deeply fueling and important to him and that he was losing the ability to do that um, just, just was devastating, right? Yeah. And that's something that, that no one was talking about at the time that these things were happening. But I think Sean Levy um, 
amongst others, but Sean Levy really as a colleague, right? Like I, I think as a director, he understood deeply what it meant to, to not be able to be yourself as a professional and as a, mm-hmm. as a sort of performer and, and the toll that that would take on you. Um, so that was, that was some of the things that were happening at that point. I mean, I think it's it, it, like everything in retrospect, especially when it comes to things like mental illness, I think it's only in retrospect we often then finally see, oh yeah, it's obvious. I mean, what struck me, I've seen the films, I've seen them with my family, um, but seeing those clips from the third night of the museum, he's, he's, he's a shadow of himself in terms of his physical appearance. And, uh, and those, I think you capture very well those film of the film, you know, where they're showing them, mm. you know, and he's just kind of standing off to the side and um, he might be next to Ben Stiller or whoever, but he's, he's just kind of, he's not himself definitely, is he? Yeah, and so we had a, the uh, Wall Street Journal did an amazing review of the film and really loved it, which was great. Um, but Joel Morgenstein, the uh, writer of that review, is one of the great critics and the film writers in the United States. Yeah. And uh, he recalled in that article that he had gone and been on the Fox lot when they were shooting that film. And yeah. he saw Robin and knew Robin well from other stories that he'd done about him. And that he thought, he writes in the article that he looked at the man and thought that Robin was his own stunt, like, was his own double like that he like you know how there's that that sort of perceptibility of like the person who's the stand-in is sort of just yeah. that much less charismatic like they kind of look like the person but yeah. there's just something missing that is that x factor thing and the idea that this guy you know this writer was on that set and just you know knew robin but couldn't recognize him um i think is really emblematic of, of the way that people were feeling about how things were going and the idea that became really troubling um at that point was you know, I think at that point, Robin had a very strong sense that he was not himself and he was really struggling with that. But that, that moment where you start seeing these things where, you know, they even had to change his, um, his Teddy Roosevelt costume because he was losing weight precipitously as part of this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so he was like looking like a shell inside this big, you know, he used to, I mean, he was actually a pretty strapping dude, right? He was yeah. really into cycling and very, like, very, yeah. very um, physically active. And so he was like, you know, a lot of his friends actually described him as like a really kind of like you know tough like you know and the idea that he was losing all this weight suddenly and like sort of looking much older than he actually was and and they were having to like make all these adjustments because of that um i think was really troubling to everyone involved but my my heart in those moments really go out to robin and this idea that he's you know he's trying to figure fill out this sort of contractual obligation but he's he's almost in no position to be on those sets at that point that's right and at the same time i think you film i mean at least what i picked up on this is that uh, and as we're going to get to in a moment, he, he himself, I mean, he obviously, he knew something bigger than what they were telling him was happening, but no one knew what was happening. And he, so how do you communicate this? You know, how do you tell people you're seeing hallucinating, you know, you're hallucinating because you don't necessarily know that you are. And there's so you, much stigma, right? Yeah. Right. But you have these sensibilities that your mind is not functioning properly but there's so much stigma around that, right? I think, you know, he had, he had an arrhythmia in his heart that they got a, they got a um, surgery for it. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. It's like, oh, he, you know, something was wrong with his heart. They fixed it. And like, you know, mm-hmm. he didn't have, there's no compunction about shame or any of that kind of stuff. Right. But for some reason, you know, like we, ju- we just have these things about if your brain isn't working properly, it, it's somehow your fault. And I think he deeply felt that. And that was part of his journey is like, you know, as you say, like there, there's a point you'll be playing here, but like the idea that he was, he was very cautious about how he talked about these, these deeply traumatic things he was experiencing because he had a lot of shame about it. Okay. And, and so um, obviously at the end, um, he, um, he ends up committing um, uh, suicide and we'll probably talk a little more about that in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but it becomes, it is this media circus. And I think you've already alluded to, you need, you have, 24 48 hours of a news cycle to come up with reasons and so uh and it's it to this day until i watched your film to be honest it's what i kind of had thought had happened um we knew he'd struggled with depression and some substance abuse over the years uh had a cocaine addiction which he was very upfront and about and included in one of his uh stand-ups um kind of the tears of a clown sort of feel or image um right and, uh, and that was very that was very troubling to a lot of the comedians that I talked to, right? Like because yeah. that's something that is real for that community. Like they do have some pretty stellar comedians who fall into you know just general depression or you know drug use as it relates to depression. Um, so the idea that Robin was getting tossed in with that group, you know, the Jim Belushi's and Chris Farley's of the world, was really troubling because that's that's not a club that they want to add more members to. And the idea yeah. that like that wasn't true for Robin and that they all had a very different sense that this was not a guy who walked around with a cloud around him. This was a 
beautiful man. And like, yeah. you know, he, he gave so much joy and was so generous. Um, that was something that I, I thought we got a lot of, we got a lot of traction with the community community because the, the idea of a sad clown is, is just, a, it's sort of a lazy trope, right? It's, and yeah, it's sort of, exactly. it doesn't even do justice to the people it might apply to. Yeah. Um, so, so the idea that part of what this film does is pull him out of that, I think is really cool. Um, okay. And gives so us all back our, our hero again. Yeah. And, and, and so, as you mentioned, we've now found out that, um, he was suffering from, uh, Louis body dementia. Um, there's a clip here, which is, um, the one that I think it's, it's one I'd like to, uh, for us to listen to, which is, um, basically I think it's his friends, Sean Levy's on there. Um, he's, what was why uh susan's obviously on there it's 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 talking about how um they want to want to set the truth straight that this wasn't you know there's this image of robin now because of what had happened again you said the stigma he commits suicide so everyone just assumes he's maybe not the person we always thought he was and why i think a lot of these people were quite willing to cooperate with you on the on this film so um let's listen to that now I think it's important that the truth comes out because there were so many affirmative things that Robin stood for and we want to believe in all of them. We want to believe in him. And there's a danger that his suicide could occasion people to think, oh, well, he, he wasn't what we thought he was. We didn't know him after all, um, but we did. I felt like I was somehow being loyal to him by not speaking about the struggles that we saw. We felt like that wasn't anyone's business. And so the story is one of Robin being at the mercy of something that you could not control. And even worse than not being able to control it, not even knowing about it. It was not till October, I was called in to sit down to go over the coroner's report. There were no surprises about what was in his toxicology. I knew my honey was clean and sober. They sat me down and said, he, you know, essentially, Robin died of diffuse Lewy body dementia. What is that? They started to talk about the neurodegeneration. He wasn't in his right mind. So this is uh, about setting the tr setting us straight, basically, about uh, what happened to Robin Williams. Um, but why haven't we heard more about this until now? I mean, I know Susan, his uh, partner, uh, did a speaking tour, I think. Um, you've mentioned to other docs about other docs, but I don't really feel like much has been done on this until your doc came along. The reason that we haven't heard about this until now is because really what we had to do in the making of this film was untell a story and then retell it in a new way that gives you new information. Um, and that process is really onerous. It's onerous for the audience, if not done well, right? Because then you yeah. not only have to hold in your mind what you'd heard before, get rid of it, and then make space for something new. I mean, that's not usually how movies go. We're giving right. you facts, you're processing those, and you're, mm. and you're you know, making a picture of what you're seeing and understanding. Um, so that was really difficult. And it was a process that I went through in making this film, which was what, you know, when Susan came to me, I said, you know, this is something that you can't be the only voice in. Um, and the process then was finding other people who could say, because she had a very clear record of the story, but I had to go vet that with all these other people. And I had this sort of concentric ring circle of a uh, theory of like, you know, you and Robin are at the center of this, but we, but really... I, in my life, my friends, I don't know something's really wrong until you can't keep it together at work anymore, right? Like there yeah. is some real value to that. Yeah. That like, of course you knew Robin better than anyone else. Of course what you saw was more intimate and more detailed than what anyone else saw. But the fact that he was on a movie set and couldn't remember his lines is yeah. in some ways more important in, uh, in certain aspects. And so that was the thing that had never been done. Sean Levy yeah. had never come forward and talked about any of this stuff. David E. That's Kelly right. had never come forward and talked about any of this stuff. So yeah. once we started getting that and Robin's friends coming together, you have a clear picture of 17 people coming together. And then in addition to that, from a journalistic standpoint, mm -hmm. um, we got uh, five different really leading organizations in terms of brain science and Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia um, to come forward and vet the science of what we did. Um, so essentially, uh, groups representing over 50,000 neurologists signed off on the mm -hmm. science in the film. So once you have those things in both hands, I think it becomes a lot easier. We've done a lot of the work for the audience. They don't have to, they don't have to say, okay, this is a perspective. And now we have to balance that against what else. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that was, that was part of the success that we've seen of the film is that we did a lot of journalistic work 
to unpack something, repackage it, and put it back in, in, a, in a way that makes you go, oh, okay, cool. I get Robin Williams back. You know, fantastic. And so how long did that take you? That sounds like it took a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I have a production company. We do commercials and all sorts of other stuff. But this was a running project that went for about three and a half years um, wow. from the moment yeah. of like conception to going through it. And uh, part of that actually was convincing people that uh, this film is not like most celebrity documentaries that you'll see. Because usually it'll sort of be like, let's start where they were born, end on the day yeah. that they died and cover their entire life in an hour and a half. Um, I was like, I just want to stay in that last year and a half and give people a real sense of what this man went through. Because I, I don't think we can shoehorn that the, all of this new information into 10 minutes at the end. Um, and so that that process took some convincing. And, um, but yeah, I think it was ultimately really worth it. Because I think it's a special film that isn't like other celebrity films that I've seen before, which made me feel like we'd done something important. I would second that, certainly. Um, and also say that, uh, believe it or not, I think, I think we're going to go to a, an early, little early break here and then uh, give our listeners a, a few seconds to, uh, I don't know, adjust their headphones or whatever they do when they have our little breaks. And we'll be straight back here with uh, Tyler Norwood. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Tyler Norwood, the director and producer and writer and cinematographer of Robin's Wish. Um, the New York Times said in roughly equal parts, the documentary Robin's Wish strives to honor the career of the peerless actor comedian Robin Williams and to raise awareness of Louis body dementia a form of progressive dementia that was diagnosed in Williams after his death from suicide in 2014. Um, Tyler, uh, I know you're not a doctor, but what is Lewy body dementia? Yeah, so one of the great things about being a filmmaker is you get to be sort of endlessly curious. So I, did, I have talked to a lot of neurologists. I have, I think, understood this disease very well. Um, but I will also caveat that by saying, not only am I not a doctor, I don't hold any degrees or, or purport to be a medical expert. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> as a lay person trying to understand this thing, uh, essentially what Lewy body dementia is, is you have this thing in your brain called alpha synuclein. And it's a, it's a protein in your brain that's very helpful. As far as neurologists understand now, it, it kind of exists at the synapse. So it sort of uh, helps in the transition of electricity and, and basically helps your brain run smoother. Um, the problem that happens when Lewy body dementia begins is these proteins start clumping up um, and you can sort of imagine them as kind of becoming knotted. So they, they become these big clumps. And what those clumps, unfortunately, do is they, they begin shutting down portions of the brain because they're just taking up space that they shouldn't be taking up, right? Mm. You don't have a lot of extra space in your brain. Um, and right. so when something starts taking up that space, it starts changing the functionality of your brain. Um, what's really interesting is you're, you have this thing called neuroplasticity. And Robin had it in spades because basically uh, it's the concept of if, you, if you're a muscle-bound muscle sort of weightlifter and you get MS, um, you know, multiple sclerosis, you'll last much longer than say you or I would with the same thing because you have more sort of, yeah. that can be worn down and still maintain functionality. So Robin had this intensely sort of facile, like a dynamic brain. Um, but as this, as this disease sort of grew and, and took over more and more of his brain, his, his, he, like anyone else, um, uh, mm -hmm. fell to this thing. And essentially what it does is it, it, it starts kind of at your brain stem. Um, and so it's working in kind of deep parts of your brain. So this is why, unlike Parkinson's, which is very much on the same spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so Parkinson's we associate with shaking. Uh, mm -hmm. Lewy body dementia ends with Parkinson's symptoms. So it kind of works from your, the inside of your brain out. And then Parkinson's sort of works from the outside in, if you want to think about it simply. Um, it's very overly generalized, but it is important to know that they're the same thing. Because okay. um, what happens at the end of Robin's life is he gets a Parkinson's diagnosis. Uh, and so people went, oh, so he had Parkinson's. Well, he'd gone through all the horrible symptoms that people with Parkinson's end with. He'd already gone through all of those. And then he started having these motor issues that were, yeah. that were very visible. And people would say, oh. Um, so that's the important thing is that, that people with Parkinson's, they start with motor issues and they end with all of the horrible things that Robin went through in the, in the early days and then only worsened as he went along which is uh, delusions, uh, basically an impossibility of sleeping. You, you kind of can never enter REM sleep. And so the idea of you know, that oh being God. absolutely a torture technique, right, is to keep people yeah. from sleeping. Um, and, then so, and the delusions is, is like the number one thing. And then also because of dysregulation of brain chemicals due to the damage that these little bodies are, are 
have anything inside your brain. Uh, de de depression is, is like the third most you know, important symptom, but there's like 40 symptoms. I mean, you can't really start poking around, basically creating holes in someone's brain and not have it be showing up in, a, in, a, in all these different ways. Um, so it's a really nasty thing. Uh, top line is it's a devastating neurological disease. It's, there are no treatments for it. There are no cures for it. So it's a one-way ticket um, to, to full uh, neurological, uh, you know, uh, your, your system basically shuts down, right? Your, your lungs mm -hmm. eventually will shut down. Your, um, so it, it's, a, it's a bad, bad thing. And, um, you know, people with Parkinson's that I talked to were terrified of the later symptoms and, and they understand too well that people with Lewy body dementia, yeah. um, that they have the worst ride. Because the nice thing about Parkinson's is you can be stable for quite some time before all these things start setting in. Yeah. Um, but with, with Lewy body dementia, um, you feel it and you feel it deeply uh, and it alters the way you are and it alters who you are. Uh, from a medical standpoint. And I think, uh, I mean, you've already alluded to uh, Robin Williams and this fast cell brain, but I, I think it comes out in the film that uh, basically uh, mere mortals, if you will, or people certainly who didn't have his uh, brain reserves or resilience would have been, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a miracle that he was able to continue acting uh, in those last. No, absolutely. Months. I mean, so important for your audience to understand is one of the doctors who looked at his brain on autopsy was, surprised that that person was even able to walk yeah so the idea that robin was like doing as much as he was doing and, and a doctor looked at his brain and said this person should be walking yeah and maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about um uh what is uh what is being done and uh, as you've already mentioned the 50 i think you've mentioned fifty thousand, if i remember correctly neurologists um mm -hmm. there are organizations this is the first time i've seen a doc where the sponsors are include the BU School of Public Health. And uh, uh, I think uh, Savonics is in there. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the people who are behind this, uh, this film. Yeah, so it was, um, what I would say is because I had that, that this kind of maybe uh, unreasonable fixation on making sure that the film focused on this period of his life so that we could go deep and wide yeah. rather than sort of just kind of cover it quickly. Um, I ended up funding it for, my, for the most part myself. And then at the very end, we needed finishing funds and this great organization, Savonics, who um, basically are, are concerned with doing uh, brain neuroplasticity uh, exams for elderly mm -hmm. people uh, generally. So the idea that I think right now, I mean, this is a little plug for them. I think that's what you're asking for. Well, um, I mean, I, I don't mind. I just, I think it's interesting because, no, from a docu, I mean, as you, as you said, yeah. you, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of your, you had a lot of skin in the game, but uh, it's interesting yeah. at this times like this, what's happening with docs and um, we've had some docs yeah, you, here you, on, I mean, you know. You have to, you have you to know. get funded any way you can. And, and yeah. I mean, to their credit, Savonics came through and said, how much do you need? Um, and, and they were very generous to do that, but they, they have a, a Basically, their, their idea is that people, the reason it made sense to me, because I was even sort of uh, careful and very thoughtful about who I even took money from, but mm. the idea that made sense to me is that the things that they're creating are these sort of exams that you could take theoretically on an iPad, right? But mm. currently, you have to take those in front of a doctor, and they have to watch you do these tests, and the test can be hours long, and so if you're 70 or 80 years old, and standing in front of a doctor taking a test for two hours mm -hmm. seems really onerous. Uh, the idea that you could do that on your iPad from home and they could diagnose you that way um, seems really exciting. I mean, it's the whole telehealth thing, which I think yeah. is going to be a real big deal, especially as it relates to COVID, right? Like it's really tough to yeah. get an elderly person to the hospital and dangerous. Yeah. Um, so the idea that telehealth is sort of rising and they're a part of that, especially as it relates to virology and getting people diagnosed, which I think becomes the, the moment for Robin that I think is, is the absolute heartbreaker for me is that he never got to know what this was. And so yeah. until, until the end, he thought maybe there's something he's not doing, right? Maybe there's mm. something, right? Get back to that Sean Levy quote about somebody who wasn't themselves and thought it was unforgivable, right? The idea that, that Robin really held this is like, I'm not doing enough. There's something I'm not thinking of. And he, and he kind of went to the end of his life with some sense of that, I think. And I think, I mean, that's specifically this, uh, Dewey body dementia, but I, I do, uh, Louis body, I'm sorry, uh, dementia, but I, I wonder, uh, I, I think people, it must be what a lot of people with mental health toy with. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but they, we don't really know what's going on in that, in those heads of theirs and what they, the anguish, uh, and, and even as great as your film is, you, you, you yourself can't even really get that across. We don't know what he was thinking those last the last few days of his life though i think you have the great the 
Yeah, the the neighbors, which I thought was really interesting, is getting his neighbor neighbor. That's an incredible story. Yeah, Robin. One of the things that Robin did um, is, and he lost his father at like a youngish age. I think he was forty or something like that. Yeah. So he went through a good chunk of his life without a father. And and what he did is he found people like the great comedian Jonathan Winters, and they yeah, became really close friends. And and kind of there was, a, but there was an age difference where it was it was kind of a fatherly thing. Yeah. Um, and then he found this guy down the street, this guy John Heffer, who's an I mean, I think John's okay with this, but he's an ex-CIA, like, accountant okay. or something. I was like, I don't, <laughs> this guy is like James Bond. Um, you're a CIA accountant? What does that mean? Uh, but, but like, Robin loved the military, right? And so, I mean, these guys yeah. totally hit it off. And, and so much so that on the last night of Robin's life, when he, he had some sense possibly of, of what he was going to be in, going through that evening, um, he went and sought out John Hepper and, and asked for a hug. And, you know, John kept kept personal what it is the exact substance of what they talked about yeah, um but yeah. you get the sense that this was a guy who just had run out of energy like he'd been fighting so diligently mm. and so um purposefully for for months and years actually at that point and only to find that every day he was less well off than he was the day before and losing all these faculties and one of the things that um you know as it relates to de, to uh delusions which are terrifying right like mm. the idea of a, of a of a hallucination is that you believe something's happening that isn't happening right and those right. things can be you know benign like a, a dog running that isn't running mm. like through the room uh to something very terrifying happening and, and not being able to discern what's real and what's not and the idea that that's the number one um uh, symptom of, of Lewy body dementia really gets to the point of like the things Robin must have had to endure that, yeah. that he never spoke about because he was afraid of being put away. I mean, I think that was something that Susan notes in the film is that, you know, he, he was really scared um, from some of his, I mean, this gets to the core of who you are, but you know, some of his childhood trauma was about being abandoned and this feeling of, of being separated from those that he loves. And the idea that he thought that if maybe he started talking about these things he was seeing, um, you have to imagine he believed that that would then relate they'd say, oh, we're going to put you away now. Um, yeah, even, even, I mean, yeah. and, and he had this childlike, you know, the, mm. essentially one of the doctors said that when he passed, he was, he had the mind of like a three-year-old, right? Like his ability to process complex thoughts was that of a three-year-old. Interesting. And so at one point near the end, a doctor, because of all the sleep dep deprivation he was going through, um, was realizing in a, in, a, in a exam meeting that Susan was sitting next to him. It was like, Susan, what are, are you getting sleep? And she was like, I haven't slept in a few days. And it's like, that's not okay. And so he was like, you guys have to sleep. To, you have to sleep apart because yeah. Susan, you're the only one taking care of him. You, ha you guys have to get separated. But even that, Robin couldn't understand and, and said, Are, does, this mean, does this mean we're separated? Yeah. Does this mean we're like divorced? And it's it, it, like, so it crushes me to know that his, his, he had this inability to process what was happening. But even, even there, was, there was a slight bit, which is that when he got his Parkinson's diagnosis, he stopped the doctor and said, are you sure I'm not schizophrenic? Are you sure yeah. I don't have dementia? Yeah. And the yeah. doctor said, no, you're okay. So, I mean, he did, he did, he did like ask for help in the right way and the best way that he could. Um, just unfortunately, the medical professionals that were, that were helping him just weren't equipped to, to, to act at that moment. But, but like, he does actually say it. And that, that's the part that, you, wow like you know so that's yeah. the part right i say man this guy was really fighting he was he was pushing yeah. he was doing everything that you or i could have done um mm -hmm. and it was out of his control it's a one-way ticket it's a it's an incurable yeah. disease that ends in death so i mean i think that's the thing where that last night where he's talking to john hepper i think he's having to make peace with that just unfortunately he's having to do that without the understanding that this thing is called Louis body dementia it's yeah. not his fault yeah. and like this would happen no matter what he did yeah and i think uh, on that point, I mean, the film's titled Robin's Wish. Um, I know the answer, but maybe you can tell us what Robin's wish was. And I think because that wish is what that wish is, uh, it, I think your film is helping, helping with that. But tell us what Robin's wish uh, was or is. Yeah, so, so for me, Robin's wish is twofold. One, I think his, his personal sort of like, uh, wish for himself is that he would have had a diagnosis. I think, I think if there's any sort of an afterlife and he has mm. any perspective of looking back, he, damn, I wish I could have known that yeah. like this thing wasn't my fault. Like that yeah. would have meant a lot. Yeah. Um, and it also would have given him and his wife the ability to sort of like process this thing together. And they're both so resilient, right? They're both, they're both ex addicts. They both mm -hmm. come from this like very difficult past. You know, Robin really in a lot of ways surmounted his own depression. And, and, and that was through daily exercise and, and really 
staying ahead of it and on top of it. Like this is a guy who could handle adversity. If you'd have told him this is what it was, I, I have every confidence that he would have said, okay. Right. Um, and, the, and that would have begun a, a process of healing as he was passing. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I think gets to the thing that we can all really latch on to is that Rob cared about the world. Right. I think that's the reason he gave so much. He worked so hard and he used his genius for sort of a, a benefit to others, you know, because I think he could have been a, a wonderful CEO of a company or he could, you know, he could have found another way to use his incredible intellect. Um, yeah. But he, he wanted to give it to us. And so what's amazing is that when his um, wife was going through the process of, of this film and doing her interviews, it was very difficult for her. Uh, and there was a period where after one of the particularly difficult interviews, she, she went to his bedside table, which she hadn't gone into since he passed um, as a, sort of his private space. And she wanted to keep it for him. But she just needed something from him. She needed some message or some some sort of thing that you can imagine a, a widow might be in a moment of, of needing. Um, and she opened up his AA book. And on that first page, that's usually blank in every book, uh, mm -hmm. he'd written in, in big, bold, sort of like uh, flourish, flourished uh, cursive. I want. I just want to help people be less afraid. Um, and he mm -hmm. dated it and signed it. And you kind of get this sense of like that's what he was always doing, right? Because this this thing that she found of him wanting to help everyone be less afraid that that that, that was really his wish, um, always, right? Like it's mm -hmm. the reason that someone gets on stage and hopes to make us all laugh, right? There's there's a personal aspect of mm -hmm. them hoping maybe I'll entertain, maybe I'll get some sort of personal rush out of this, but it's a, it's a communal activity, right? It's a, it's a, yeah. he, he gives you something and then you laugh and, and let him know that he's doing the right thing. And then they can continue. And that's kind of how comedy works. But you know, he was a brilliant dramatic actor. He went to Juilliard. He has an mm -hmm. Oscar for Goodwill Hunting. Um, so the idea that he could, he could give us all a range of emotions that he could sort of mirror to us and that, and that we could feel through him. Um, so the idea that Robin's real wish in his life was to help us all be a little less afraid. My big hope for this film is that someone watches this, um, their heart opens back up to him as they understand what this guy really was and that actually, that set to that sad clown point, um, mm -hmm. that you realize that actually the guy behind all this work was better than the work, right? Like you, you can't yeah. make, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, like, you can't you can't fake it right you can't fake it yeah. for that long you can't trick people for that long like robin the man was better than robin williams the movie star um and so i think once people have that that sense i hope that when the credits are running they, they fire up mrs doubtfire or hook or aladdin or, or or just one of those fun loving beautiful robin williams films that's their favorite and it has an experience of him coming back into their life um you know for me it's the birdcage or things like that that are just like right. incredible moments for me um, yeah. that actually I'd, I'd sort of tamped down because I thought maybe there was some darkness associated. And so the idea that that's mm -hmm. not true and we can all have that back, I think is a huge service to him. And it really, it really brings into full focus um, his wish, which is that we all be a little less afraid. We all take bigger steps and we all, we all sort of open ourselves up to, um, to the journey of life. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that kind of takes me further into this, the, the whole, the whole project. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, this is more than a companion piece to, uh, I mean, obviously there's the doc that came out, Robin Williams, Come Inside My Mind, that was HBO 2018. Uh, this is much more than a companion piece. I mean, it's interesting, there's an aggregator, Robin Williams, Come Inside My Mind, offers a poignant, albeit tantalizing, incomplete peek behind the curtain of a brilliant performer's tragically curtailed life and career. That struck me because uh, in the context of your film, albeit tantalizing, incomplete, I mean, uh, it's, I mean, we're not trying, I'm not talking down the film at all, but they didn't come into his mind really, did they? Or it's certainly not the last, uh, couple of years. And you've already alluded to this, but what I wasn't aware of was, as you said, this humanitarian side, all the USO tours. I mean, how yes. many times did he go to Baghdad and, and, uh, Afghanistan? I mean, it was absolutely remarkable. I think the incredible thing to that point about his service um, that just came to my mind as you said that is uh, we interviewed four star generals for this project <laughs> about you know, just yeah. saying like, what was it like for him to like be, uh, be, you know, you know, what did you, what was your experience? Did he seem fake or, you know, what was it like to have Robin Williams like coming out to Baghdad for the troops or going to Afghanistan? He went seven or eight times just during, just during those, those conflicts, but he'd gone, I think, many many times um and so i was talking to these four-star generals and you're a little nervous when you're talking to a four-star general about saying the wrong thing because like you know they're just very imposing i think that's yeah. why they get that job yeah. um and so i was like you know I, i'm not saying robin served but you know he did he did go out there a lot and the guy was like let me interrupt you robin did serve robin served this you know and and it was one of those things where i was like holy crap like it just gave me this real sense of like 
Mm. You don't get that easily, right? Like the, these are guys who do not give compliments as a, as a sort of point of point of work. Like that is not something that they do freely. Um, it, it was a very clear statement of Robin's service to his community, to his mm. country. Um, were deep and uh and and felt and that was something for me that I, I i took real like oh wow okay like this is this is impressive like this is something that i think people should know and i think it i think it's a part of his character um and that was that was really the delineator for us on this film was you know robin williams the actor the comedian the entertainer i i think that the other film does an incredible job of giving mm a well-deserved rounding out of like who and yeah. what this thing was that like captivated the world <laughs> for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Um, but, but we also had this additional thing, which was like, yeah, but who was Robin? Like who was the yeah. guy who no one knew about who was suffering with this disease and what did he do when no one was looking? Right. Yeah. I, I think that's everything. Um, and, and what he did when no one was looking is he would go to Walter Reed hospital and he would sit with yeah. soldiers and counsel them. Um, and there's a beautiful retelling of one of those stories in the film about about sitting with an injured soldier whose whose girlfriend had run out of the room once she saw him, you know, I, come back from the battlefield missing an yeah. arm and a leg and was not coming back. And the idea that Robin goes into that room doesn't just try and make this guy laugh. He sits with him and he hears him and he shares his own sort of journeys with with these kinds of moments of, of real unrest in your spirit of, of like, mm. I don't know where this goes next, but that there is some lasting hope that can be found in in sticking it out and, and being of service to others and i think you know those are the things that you can take away from robin the man that you know are really yeah. really profound and lasting and give a completely different um light to to the legacy that he left us all with and i think uh, i mean i personally just for me personally i did find that uh, the scenes with the uh, the wounded soldiers um for me those were the most emotional ones i think uh, but i think um this ability to connect, I think one of the generals said, look, soldiers have a real good bullshit detector. And uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure that's the term he used, but essentially it was. That's uh, it. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and there's Robin connecting with him. It wasn't just uh, Good Morning Vietnam acting that out. I mean, he actually was connecting with these, these guys. Um, he seemed to, I mean, we won't, you know, it's it's all in the film, folks. Everyone needs to see this. But uh, you know, he could have he could have got bought a an exclusive house in a gated community or something. But he didn't. He goes lives in a neighborhood, and is on a cul-de-sac with like a lot of Americans are, you know, and uh, knows his neighbors. And um, I mean, it's a it's I I think you do that very well. This capturing Robin the man, which is something that uh, at least for me. Um, I don't know. I, I maybe I, not so much reinstated his my opinion of him, but I, I think just gave me a, a sense of of the man that I had not had previously. Which, for whatever reason, we don't tend to cover these things in 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 the world and in, in media. But uh, in doing the interviews, you said you've got the like these. I think it's seventeen people come on camera um, now. You uh, you focus well. We have some stars in the sense of you know famous, relatively famous directors and producers, but you you know I guess you imagine you could have had some really big stars come on on uh, camera, but you 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 didn't. Was that a conscious decision? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we wouldn't have turned anybody away if they'd have come to us, but we you know you only have so much energy to put towards these things. And yeah. um, kind of getting back to that concentric circle thing, I mean, it was it was really like you know, as you said, the people in his neighborhood really knew him. You know, the guy who lived down the street really knew him. They were friends. Um, and that those were the people who saw the things that he didn't want the world to see, right? He didn't want, um, yeah. you know, sort of his movie star friends to see who, you know, wouldn't, you know, they're not in daily contact. They're not even in monthly contact, right? It's like, it's these people in his neighborhood who see him when he walks his dog and they talk, you know, he stops by the fence and they chat for 10 minutes and they realize Robin's not quite the way he used yeah. to be and yeah. and they start sort of piecing these things together um really organically and so for us yeah it, it was about something really honest um and and the truth was that the people who really knew him and the people who were in his life and who worked with him um are in the movie yeah. and um and it, felt, it felt like a complete record yeah. I, I didn't feel like at any point we missed something uh, I think if, if that would have been the case and it would have been a movie star, I would have, I would have chased them to the ends of the earth. <laughs> but like, but, but we didn't, I felt like we had a really complete record. What about his children? Did, 
Did you yeah. think about including them? Or maybe it's, I, mean, I can only imagine what it would be like to try to go on camera for something like this. Exactly. Um, I think the only reason Susan went on camera is because she felt like this is something that they went through together. And then and in some really profound way that as a wife, that this was her duty was to make mm -hmm. sure that the world understood who her husband really was. I think that his children have every right to their privacy and no, no necessity to be in this film. I don't think um, they would have yeah. added a lot because again, one of the things that really is a credit to him as a father is he didn't really tell them what was going on. Like he kept mm. a lot of this from them um, in order to, you know, you just don't do it, right? Like if you have yeah. kids, I don't know if you have kids, but like yeah. if you started thinking, hey, there's something wrong with my brain, you wouldn't say, hey, something's wrong with dad's brain. We don't know what it is. It's kind of scary, but we'll let you know. we'll check back in later. Yeah. It's like, you know, and so yeah. the idea that he didn't do that, I think is a real credit to him. Um, and so in a lot of ways, as far as I understand, uh, you know, they, they were caught off guard by his suicide as well. And, and they went through a whole period of, of you know, as, as anyone would, I lost my mother at, I think, 23. And you just go through this yeah. process of healing that takes years. And so it's only been six or seven years since Robin passed. And, I, you know, I, I, I hope that they watch the film and it means something to them. And then, as we've already alluded to, Susan felt a duty to come on camera. But this must have been hell for her to go through this, to relive that, those, that <sighs> last year and a half she was not prepared to go as deep as I needed her to go. Um, mm. And that was something that we worked through very closely together. And there was some stuff, you know, frankly, that I, as a director, it was some of the most intimate and powerful interviewing that I'd ever had to do to get to yeah. where we needed to get to. Um, and again, that was all because everybody thought they already knew the story, right? If yeah. nobody knew the story, you wouldn't quite have to push so hard or, or dig so deep, but it was like, mm. we're going to have to like yank people out of their, of their mindset. And, and the only way you do that is by going there. And so, yeah, we did, we actually did three uh, two hour sessions of interviews. So we have six hours of interview with Susan and she catalogs everything from the moment they first met and then they're dating and him making funny raccoon voices at the dinner table with like her kids to like, you know, all the way until the end and the moments where she's receiving the call that he's passed. And, and yeah. um, you know, it just, it's, it's really a powerful record. And I'll, I, I will say, uh, the thing I was left with after that, after that six hours of really intense interview was a portrait of love that, that I hadn't seen yeah. um, in my own life. I, I, was, I was really touched by the way that they faced this horrible, terrifying thing together. Yeah. Um, that, that was something I was like, wow, I hope someday, if I'm lucky enough to have a partner like, like, like a Susan and something mm. like this happened, that they would do the kind yeah. same for me yeah. and, and the same to actually to robin's um friends you know what i mean like the way that his friends stood up and said like you know this isn't popular this isn't going to make me more famous um but mm. it needs to be done right like david e kelly and sean levy his colleague like they took a big risk there's nothing for them to gain from talking yeah. out of school about something like this mm. um that was really kept secret for so long you know sean levy says in the film there was 200 people on the set at night at the museum and no mm. one ever yeah. came out and talked about this Indeed. Um, I think that's a big deal. Yeah. And I think um, the thought came to me too, is I think my own situation and I, you know, I live overseas, but my parents are in, in the States and uh, you know, I, I don't know what they're going through on a day to day basis. You know, I, we, you know, you have those as a child, if I'm thinking in terms of even the children, you know, you call whatever it is every few days or, or whatnot, yeah. but the, the day to day. And, and as you say, they're not going to tell you uh, anyway, basically. So um right. You know, and it's uh, a service of being a good father, right? Yeah. It's just not scaring your kids. Yeah, well, I, I need to do a better job of it. Um, I think you also <laughs> bring in your, uh, your, you bring in some metal ex, medical experts. I found very interesting, this, uh, I, is it Dr. Bruce Miller, who you basically have in yeah. a darkened lecture hall? I thought that was really yeah. interesting how you did that, uh, because at first I thought you were filming a lecture, and then I realized, no, there's, I don't think there's anyone it's in just there. You to the audience and, and he's in and it's <laughs> yeah. really dark and you got the the lighting i mean what 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 went behind what was the filmmaking behind that the decisions that you were making yeah so you, you know you have these stereotypical like kind of horror horror things for an audience which is to watch a doctor in a lab coat sort of yeah. extol some some long syllable um diatribe but um what, what we were able to do with dr bruce miller uh, who's a world expert and this is well in his own right could have easily done that for us um, is to ask him to really push it. And I, I was like, you know, be a little theatrical here. Like, you know, obviously stay within the facts, but like, I think we need to shock an audience. We need to give them something that's visually entertaining, but also like is spoken mm. in a way that like, 
you know, doesn't qualify every sentence that we, that we yeah. sort of say some things that are, that are a little bit shocking. Um, and so he, he went for it. And I, I, I thank him for it. Cause I think it really is a, a, a fun part of the movie is to be learning about these things, but in a way that feels cinematic a bit. I, I, I would completely agree with that. Um, Tyler, it's hard to believe. I think we're coming to the end of our time together, but I uh, just want to ask you what's uh, next for you in terms of, do you have any projects on the go? Uh, it's COVID, you know, COVID must be posing a challenge there, needless to say. As far as what I'm working on now, uh, I'm really excited about a few things. We have some, some exciting projects that I think are going to be really uh, sort of interesting. The important thing is that we have a scientific version of this film coming out. And if audiences want to get involved with Robin's Wish and how they can help after they watch the film, uh, if they go to the film's website, we have a lovely link to our consulting partners, which are the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Louis Body Dementia Association. Association, Parkinson's Foundation, American Brain Foundation, and the Lewy Body Dementia Resource Center, um, all of which are incredible organizations. And there's ways to donate and there's ways to just learn more about the Excellent. disease from a scientific aspect if people are like looking for additional research. Okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds great, Tyler. I think that's, uh, that's certainly very important. And uh, look forward to that, uh, more, uh, that, that science talk. If, uh, if we haven't scared you off, we'll have to have you come back on and uh, discuss that. So um, I want to thank you again, uh, Tyler Norwood. Uh, the film is Robin's Wish. It's what we've been talking about today. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I want to give a shout out to This Is Distorted Studios here in Leeds, England. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.